During the 26 years of John Paul II's pontificate, he constantly broke the mold. His moral authority allowed him to meet the leaders of the world, and he succeeded in establishing diplomatic relations with 67 new countries, and traveled more than a million kilometers in his 104 trips abroad. He said it a few days before he was elected Pope. I want to get to know the Bedouin. I want to be with those who are suffering in the hospital, to the cloistered religious. I want to get to know the people. I want to go through all the doors. It was an itinerant pontificate. The backdrop of this papacy is no longer the dome of St. Peter's, but the world. His first trips to South America set a style that would later characterize his pontificate. He shunned protocol and preferred to have direct contact with people. It was not long before he got the name the Globe Trotter Pope. In his 104 journeys to the five continents, he circled the globe 29 times, the equivalent of going to the moon three times and back. St. Peter's Square proved to be too small for him, and he opted to travel the world instead. The Pope spent more than two years of his pontificate on the road. When a child in a Roman parish asked him, why do you travel so much, the Pope answered, Go and read the Gospel. Jesus said to his apostles, Go out to the whole world. I am doing what Jesus said, and I believe that being aware of his mission is the most important thing. His destinations were often exotic and far from the reality of Vatican City. He visited with the rich and the poor. He spoke in stadiums and shanty towns. He was always willing to absorb the local culture. But while people usually welcomed him warmly, sometimes political leaders lent a deaf ear to his message. Some political leaders also described John Paul II's speeches as interfering in local affairs. When he visited Sandinista Nicaragua in 1983, the Pope was not shy about showing his disapproval of the government's attempts to limit the church's activity. It was the only visit in which groups close to the government shouted slogans against the Pope during a Mass. Despite this, the Pope did not hesitate to scold the Minister of Culture, who was a priest. I believe there was the desire to help a person with the solemnity and the seriousness that the case demanded, perhaps to remind him of some principles of Catholic priesthood through the secular tradition of the Church and the inappropriateness of a Catholic priest being present in the field of politics. On the other side of the political spectrum, Chile hosted John Paul II in 1987. The Pope met with Pinochet in a private meeting with no official speeches, and the leader tried to take advantage of the situation, appearing on the balcony with John Paul II. On his trips, the Pope does not visit political regimes, but people. And the Pope went to Chile because he was invited by the Catholic bishops, bearing in mind all the circumstances at play. The Pope went to Chile, met the Chileans, and spoke to them absolutely freely. A historic trip to Cuba in 1998 was covered by press from around the world. At a mass attended by communist holdout Fidel Castro, John Paul called for religious freedom and slammed state atheism. A pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the year 2000 was a highlight in John Paul II's voyages. It was a journey rich in religious, political, and symbolic meaning. And the Pope's visit to a mosque in Damascus would be another record. It was the first time the head of the Catholic Church had set foot in one. 
Fue una proposición que It was an idea that came from the local church of Syria and Muslim leaders in the region. Together they asked the Pope to come to visit the mosque, also because according to tradition, the tomb of St. John the Baptist is there. China and Russia, however, were the only two destinations that the Pope wanted to visit, but never got the chance. He invented the concept of a traveling Pope and it was essential during his papacy. John Paul II wished to see people face to face, and in this way, he brought the church over to the world. Thanks to Karol Wojtyla, from now on, it'll be impossible to think of a pope who does not travel. The end of communism in Eastern Europe wasn't John Paul II's only contribution to international peace efforts. Solo lui ha parole di vita. Sì, di vita eterna. His first intervention came just months after he took office. It was Christmas, 1978. The Pope sent a Vatican representative to Chile and Argentina in an attempt to resolve the crisis over the Beagle Channel. That was a, a, a turning point in the, in the um, situation. And afterwards, the process uh, permitted uh, 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 that the negotiations between both countries and, um, uh, continue and the, um, and the Holy See um, proposed uh, uh, um, solutions. Dinanzi agli occhi di tutto il mondo. Back then, the debate centered on whether it was appropriate for the Pope to take political sides. Years later, when war broke out in Iraq, the Vatican agenda would play out a little more subtly. But there were some conflicts, like in the Middle East and September the 11th, when an answer to peace seemed impossible. Six giorni prima del Natale, diciamo fermatevi. In these instances, the Pope did the only thing he could, and that was simply to pray. For more than a quarter of a century, John Paul II used his papal platform to create peace in every corner of the world. Dio dei nostri padri, grande e misericordioso, Signore della pace e della vita, Tu hai progetti di pace e non di afflizione. Condanni le guerre e abbatti l'orgoglio dei violenti. Padre di tutti, ascolta il grido unanime dei tuoi figli. Mai più la guerra, avventura senza ritorno. Mai più la guerra, spirale di lutto e di violenza. Unlike the rest of the 20th century popes, growing up, Karol Wojtyla counted women among some of his closest friends and it was an affection for women he demonstrated throughout his papacy. On his more than 100 trips abroad, he not only reached out to them with his words, but with his arms as well. In the Jubilee year in 2000, the world watched as he openly embraced a young former prostitute battling AIDS. But it wasn't just his physical approach to women that some say revolutionized the papacy, there were his writings too. From his encyclicals, apostolic letters, and countless speeches, the Pope reminded the world of woman's special dignity, and even her, quote, feminine genius. Per un rinnovato apprezzamento della missione della donna nella società, sarebbe opportuno riscrivere La storia in modo meno unilaterale. 
quanto ancora deve essere detto e scritto circa il debito enorme dell'uomo verso la donna in ogni settore del progresso, progresso sociale e culturale. In a pastoral letter to bishops in 2004, he called on employers to support a woman's choice to work and have a family. That shocked a lot of conservatives because in there it clearly endorsed the participation of women in society at every level and that includes women working. And I think a lot of people are really wrestling with that. But long before this, the Pope's own brand of feminism began to show, and not just in his writings. He wanted women practically involved. In 1996, Harvard professor and international human rights specialist Mary Ann Glendon became the first woman to represent the Vatican, and she wasn't alone. The 22-member delegation to the Beijing conference was made up of 14 women. The Pope doesn't want to tell women what they should be thinking about yeah. feminism. He wants to listen. Mm -hmm. He wants them to tell him, what are we thinking about? And he expects us to do the work. Like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the tireless missionary whose work captured the hearts of people around the world. At her beatification, a very moved John Paul spoke of her immense courage and said that he'd always felt her beside him. There's no doubt John Paul II was a romantic. His poetry and relationships suggest not only a deeply held respect for women, but a love for them also. But there still was plenty of criticism from women who considered the church's position on issues such as abortion, contraception, divorce, and the ordination of women as behind the times. There might be a sense that, of that that is, I think, fostered by public opinion and by media, but then when you sit down and you talk with women who actually studied what the Pope said, who listened to him, who heard his words, some who even met him, you find a different experience. But of all the women he knew and loved, it was arguably the Virgin Mary who stole his greatest affection. <laughs>